Hello, uh, I'm Alexander Yerunin from the Global Oncology Diagnostic Scientific Affairs team in AstraZeneca, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Today we will talk about external quality assessment, uh, why it is so important for precision medicine. And in the second part of the webinar, we will talk about increasing use of liquid biopsy for EGFR profiling. Why access to targeted therapeutics for cancer treatment is one of the strategic imperatives for global oncology diagnostics at AstraZeneca. And one of the key aspects to achieve it is to ensure quality and accuracy of testing among all diagnostic laboratories. Participation in EQA schemes is essential for all laboratories to confirm the accuracy of the test result, to maintain quality standards, and often required for accreditation and strongly recommended in guidances, for example, ESMA. In addition, it gives extra confidence to healthcare providers and uh, patients. Although tissue samples are generally used as a standard for molecular testing for uh, cancer diagnostics, such as lung cancer, blood-based uh, blood liquid biopsy provides a minimally invasive alternative and uh, is coming now into a wider clinical practice. And since the role of liquid biopsy is quickly evolving within the therapeutic decision-making, uh, quality aspects of such tests are becoming increasingly important as well. Before we'll start, uh, just a few housekeeping points. The next slide, please. Your microphone is automatically muted uh, to avoid background noise. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded. And uh, please note that you can submit all of your questions using the Q&A uh, window. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, your feedback is increasingly important for us and uh, it will help us to improve our future events. And uh, if you would uh, spend two minutes of your time to complete our survey after the webinar, it would be greatly uh, appreciated. Thank you. Next slide, please. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, our today's uh, speakers. Uh, it's Professor Sandy Deans, who is a consultant, uh, clinical scientist, and the director of genomics quality assessment, uh, GenQA, which is a part of the UK National External Quality Assessment Service. Uh, Dr. Simon Patton, who is the manager director of the European Molecular Genetics Quality Network and Professor Christian Rolfo, uh, who is a professor of medicine and associate director for clinical research in the Center for Thoracic Oncology at the Tisch Cancer Institute. And in addition, he is a president of the International Liquid Society of Liquid uh, Biopsy. Uh, thank you for your time today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentations. Next slide. And next. To you, Simon and Sandy. Thank you, Alexander, very much indeed. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, both myself and Simon are very pleased to have you join the webinar today, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to give you an overview of the results from the 2021 Liquid Biopsy External Quality Assessment, EQA, also known as um, Proficiency Testing Scheme for Lung Cancer. So next slide, please. So really, we wanted to start with just to give you an outline of the objectives of the EQA scheme, this one in particular, which is slightly different from some of the other molecular um, pathology EQAs that we run, um, and also um, the format and how this is delivered. Then we're going to give you some results of the three cases that were provided, and then hopefully we can have a Q&A session at the end of the session after um, Dr. Rolfo's um, presentation. So the objectives of this EQA is to assess the, the testing accuracy, so the testing within the laboratories and the clinical reporting of EGFR, EGFR variants um, in liquid biopsy samples. Um, we started with EGFR in 2020 EQA um, and also in response to participant demand, we have included the KRAS gene within the genotyping um, in part of the EQA, um, which was optional because we're aware not all laboratories um, test for both genes. And really this was in the context of testing um, circulating free DNA in lung cancer samples. <clears throat> 
Now, the idea of providing the CQA is to help um, make improvements using a combination of assessment and feedback. And the feedback is given from an expert um, commentary. We have an expert panel with um, a lot of experience, a wealth of experience in the field of um, liquid biopsy testing, particularly in lung cancer. And we do this feedback both through individual laboratory reports, so that each laboratory receive a score determined by peer-reviewed marking criteria and individual comments back from the assessors. And also we generate an EQA summary report, which again, it describes the format of the EQA, the expected results, and also a lot of the information that we gather from the EQA um, through the submitted reports. And we'll touch upon that myself and Simon later on in this presentation. So the format of the EQA is to assess the ability of the participant laboratories to, and there's four elements here, so correctly determine the genotype of the samples provided. So this really is the core of the EQA. Can the labs um, test the samples and receive the um, correct results for that sample? We also pr um, provide a clinical case scenario because different interpretation of the results is dependent on what type of referral and the patient clinical management of that point of their um, treatment options or the stage of disease. So we interpret the results um, in response to the clinical referral and we're looking for a clear, concise format that is not open to misinterpretation. We also want to see correct use of international accepted standard nomenclature really predominantly HGVS nomenclature and really the importance of this is um, to help use databases and other resources going forward so the right result can be interpreted in the same context and we're all talking the same language. We also want to see um, appropriate and accurate patient and sample information and identifiers and this is very important to ensure the um, accuracy that the result is going to the right patient but also that um, we um, comply with some of the ISO standards, particularly 15189, um, whereby it's for me medical laboratories testing clinical samples. And again, it's about the right result going to the right patient at the right time. So next slide, please. So to go back to the 2021 EQA, we had participation from 55 different countries and here the graph shows the spread of the different countries. And I think you can say we have definitely got global outreach there. Um, the predominant number of participants came from China, followed then by Italy and Spain, which is of interest. We had 352 um, laboratories register, 36 of them withdrew before the EQA opened, and we had a further 24 non-submitting laboratories for a range of reasons. So at the end of the EQA, we did have um, 298 laboratories testing the samples and submitting their results to our assessment. So next slide, please. This is a schematic of the format of the EQA. Now, the EQA is provided by two of the EQA providers, EMQN and GenQA, but it's very important to highlight the fact that their EQA is run exactly the same way. It's a collaboration, and this schematic defines um, the different steps and how we do work together. So, first of all, we open for registration. So, registration is open to any interested laboratory. It doesn't matter where, where you're um, based or what type of testing you do as long as you um, are uh, providing a clinical service or setting up a clinical service um, for ctDNA testing in lung cancer. We source samples and we'll talk slightly um, more in detail a uh, moment on the samples that we require for this type of EQA, but we source the samples um, according to our defined specification and we're always looking to mimic exactly the type of samples and referrals that come into the laboratory. So we're not trying to trick anyone, we really do want to reflect your routine testing. And also to make sure that we know that the samples that we're distributing are exactly the genotype that we're expecting them to be, we perform validation on multiple methods in different laboratories. And really that's also to make sure that once we distribute the samples that we know that they can be used to obtain a reportable result. Then we have EQA distribution, and I think you can see here by the packages that with 292 laboratories, that can be quite a mammoth task, but they're distributed at the same time and obviously um, are delivered at room temperature. It, despite being liquid um, biopsy samples, they're artificial plasma material, and we've done a lot of stability studies to ensure that they are able to give that reportable result on receipt in the testing lab. <laughs> 
We have online result submissions through the 2EK provider websites according to a, a defined deadline and then we also start generating the marking assessment. So this is according to um, peer reviewed um, marking criteria um, and this is in the context of the clinical case scenarios provided so the genotyping is very clear what the results should be as expected and we also um, seek clinical um, pathology um, and clinical scientist guidance on what the interpretation should be for those clinical cases. We then have the assessment period. Again, this is um, performed by an expert panel and it is anonymized. So they do not know which laboratory have submitted which report. So thereby there's no skewed um, or bias assessment. There's a central collation of the results and that is the data that we're going to show shortly. Um, and then we, as mentioned, we provide an individual EQA um, scheme report to the laboratory and also an overarching EQA summary report. Now, because these EQAs have an interpretation element, interpretation can be open to um, subjective views. So we do have an appeals process. So if any laboratory feels that they do not agree with any deductions or any comments that have been applied through the EQA, then they have an ability to appeal. And again, these appeals are then reviewed by a, an expert panel anonymously um, and a final outcome is returned back to the laboratory. The final reports are, are then issued and we apply performance criteria just for the genotyping element of this EQA. Next slide, please. So in slightly more detail, the EQA samples for the 2021 EQA were three custom manufactured artificial plasma samples that we were commissioned from Sense ID. There was 80 nanograms per mil of CFDNA in three mil of artificial plasma and they were validated by the manufacturer using DDPCR to ensure that they had the correct variant allelic frequency um, and the samples were as expected before they were shipped to the EQA providers. So we, as I mentioned, we genotyped the EQA samples independently by three laboratories without their prior knowledge of the genotype before the EQA distribution. So here you can see here we, we chose Roche Cobas, DDPCR and also a next generation sequencing, um, which is predominantly the most common um, testing methods that we know that laboratories use. And then the question uh, was also asked of the laboratories that were looking for um, assessing the mock clinical referrals to create a scenario appropriate to interpret the genotyping results. So it's about adding that extra clinical interpretation onto your genotype report. So next slide, please. So snapshot of the testing methodologies, and I think this is the power of EQA, you can actually get an idea of what's happening on the ground in clinical service and um, of all laboratories participating. Um, and here you can see that there's three very strong um, methodologies that are in use, commonly in use. We have the, the real time PCR, um, we, which Roche Cobas, no, no surprise there, I think is one of the most predominantly used methods, um, kits for real time PCR. We also have NGS and you can see the whole raft of different um, platforms and kits that are in use here but you can see the, the peak right in the middle of the graph is all of the NGS um, participants linked together so we have a large number there and then from the middle of the graph there's a smattering of different other technologies there with droplet digital PCR being the most um, commonly used. So next slide please. So just a summary I think one of the take home messages um, from the CQA run that there's a huge number of variability of approaches and testing strategies. We had over 60 different methodologies being used, which is really quite um, astounding and we don't quite see that as, um, as often in our other, other EQAs in molecular pathology. We had 173 laboratories using real-time PCR, and as I'd mentioned, COBAS is one of the most common, hence why we use that as part of our validation testing. We had 97 laboratories using next generation sequencing, and again, as I mentioned, using many different panels. Now, the most commonly used was the Oncomine Lung CFDNA assay, which was 14 labs, um, and then all others had less than five laboratories using them. So really, there is a huge variability there in testing. And we had 44 laboratories using DDPCR. 
And I think one of the real take home messages that we'd like to get across from this EQA run is that there are many laboratories there using kits that really are not suitable or on the market specifically for CFDNA testing. A lot of solid tumour panels are being used or extraction methods and we would really encourage you to review how you're performing your testing to make sure you get that optimal result for your patient. So next slide, please. I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's going to kick off the, the summary of the results from the EQA. Thank you. Maybe on mute, Simon. I was on mute. Apologies. Brilliant. Um, yes, thank you, Sandy, for your great introduction. Um, I think what the, 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 Sandy's already highlighted the, the methodology issue here, and I think you'll see when we go through these different cases that there'll be some common themes around methodology and the use of different techno test technologies coming through in the actual results themselves. So uh, I'm going to do case one, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Kat Sandy for case two, and then come back to you for case three. Um, so looking at case one, this was a male uh, born in 1960 who had been diag diagnosed with metastatic uh, lung cancer. Um, and their original sample tissue sample had been tested and had failed on, on testing and they'd been sent to the, the, the laboratory had been sent a plasma sample for for testing for um, uh, EGFI, which was the requirement and KRAS was optional for those laboratories that un undertook KRAS testing. And to give you a feel for the split between the number of laboratories, the percentage of laboratories doing KRAS versus EGFR, about 38, 39 percent of laboratories on this sample tested KRAS. So clearly not every, every laboratory yet is doing KRAS as a, as, a, as, a, as a biomarker associated with lung cancer. Uh, looking at the sample results, so we, uh, we, uh, we didn't expect laboratories to find any pathogenic variants in EGFR, uh, but the sample did harbor a variant, a KRAS variant, a G12C variant at 6% variant allele frequency. Um, and we were ex obviously expecting laboratories to, to pick, up, pick up that variant. We were very careful, and Sandy again alluded to this in our material selection, to, to try and select variant allele frequencies um, that were detectable by, by most of the commonly used technologies. And certainly there's a very strong argument that any lab doing this type of testing should be able to detect uh, down to way below 1%. Um, but in, in real life, we see most laboratories drawing a cutoff at somewhere around 1% to 2%. Um, for this case, for case one, uh, there are eight genotyping errors. So that's 2.7% of all the samples tested by the laboratories. And there was one um, uh, interpretive area, critical interpretation error. That's 0.3% of all laboratory results tested. So next slide, please. So looking a bit more in detail at the actual types of errors we found for this sample. Um, so uh, they, the predominant number of errors, so five of those eight errors were false positive results. So one laboratory incorrectly uh, reported the presence of an EGFR exon 19 deletion, uh, in addition to the KRAS variant they had actually detected. There were two laboratories that, inc that incorrectly reported the presence of uh, another EGFR variant. So uh, in this case, L85, uh, L858R. Um, one laboratory incorrectly reported the presence of a, uh, an exon 19 deletion in, X in EGFR and also uh, an L858R variant. And another laboratory correctly reported the presence um, of another variant uh, in addition to the expected KRAS variant, so another EGFR variant. There was also one false negative result. Uh, so in this case, the laboratory failed to pick up the, the, G the expected KRAS G12C variant. Uh, one laboratory uh, incorrectly reported the KRAS variant. So they did, instead of detecting uh, KRAS G12C, they detected KRAS G12R. And finally, one other laboratory did detect a variant in exon 2 of KRAS, but they did not provide any data details on the test scope or the limitations of the tests they employed. Um, and again, this is a theme that we, we, we will see, we'll, we'll come back to. Um, it's about how you report the sensitivity limits of detection of the assays that you actually use. Next slide, please. So looking at, in more detail at the interpretive error that was reported. So again, just to re-emphasize that these types of errors, the critical genotyping errors and critical interpretation errors, these errors are categorized as critical because they may have uh, an impact on patient management. So in, in many cases, a patient wouldn't get treated with a drug, for example, if you've, if you've got the wrong, wrong uh, variant. 
Um, so we classify all of these critical errors as, as significant, and therefore they they do, in certain intensive context of the genotyping errors, lead to uh, poor performance criteria later on in the EQA at the end of it. Uh, we don't provide poor performance at the moment on in critical interpretation errors, and in this one case, there was one error that we deemed to be critical interpretive error. So in this case, the laboratory incorrectly suggested that the result indicates that the patient would likely benefit from an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor as a subsequent therapy. And of course, here in this case, the patient didn't have an EGFR uh, variant and they had a KRAS variant, um, the KRAS G12C variant. Um, there is uh, very good data from a phase two clinical trials that shows that a KRAS inhibitor uh, targeting this particular variant, so G12C, has activity in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and on the strength of that data, uh, the, the drug has been licensed in, by the FDA and the EMA, EMEA uh, for approval of use in patients. And further fa uh, phase three clinical trials are still ongoing. So we, we are completely acknowledge that the drug may not be ready, readily available in all countries. But um, we do expect, and the, the assessors were very clear on this, that um, we expect laboratories performing KRAS testing to have an awareness of the trial data and to provide some sort of interpretation in respect to the use of these inhibitors. Uh, it, clearly, these drugs are showing, good, showing very strong promise and it's very likely that they will be pres prescribed and, and, and readily available in many countries in the near future. So laboratories really should have an awareness of the type, these types of drugs and the, the impact they may have on patient care. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and just a couple of other common deductions that we saw from, the, from this particular case. Uh, so again, a common theme really um, across this case, but also the other three cases, over-interpretation of the result. So in this case, the over-interpretation of the, uh, e the absence of the EGFR uh, variant. So as uh, this sample didn't have the EGFR variant detected in the original sample, it's, very, it's far too strong to suggest that the patient is unlikely to, be, to respond to or be a response to a second or third generation EGFR appropriate targeted therapy. In addition to that, there was no recommend uh, there was the, there's no recommendation for testing of a, of a repeat sample, a repeat sample or a tissue biopsy. So if you didn't detect it, you might want to check another sample or get a repeat sample to test. Um, and again, failing laboratory, quite a few laboratories were really uh, very poor at providing sufficient information about the methodology used or the limitations of that methodology or assay that they actually perform. Uh, again, a very common theme across this EQA, but also across quite a few of the other molecular pathology EQAs that we run together. Okay, I think that's end of case one. I think we're going to move to case two with Sandy. Thanks, Simon. So again, this was a, a referral for EGFR and essential testing and KRAS optional. So this, um, this male was presented with a persistent cough, shortness of breath, all the, the particular um, regular um, symptoms of um, testing required for lung cancer. Um, and the testing had been requested to define management because there was not a possibility to have um, tissue type um, tissue testing available. So this sample was designed to have a very common EGFR mutation, the resistance mutation on L85. It are um, at 6% allelic frequency, and there were no KRAS pathogenic variants um, present in the sample. Um, we saw a higher rate of errors compared to case one. Um, in this case here, we had 13 genotyping errors, so that's critical genotyping errors when a patient would have received the incorrect results with 4.5% of participants. Um, we also um, had some interpretation error, a uh, one error there, which again was 0.3%. So we'll go into these in a wee bit more detail now. So next slide, please. So we had, um, he's, here are the false positive um, results that were reported. Again, um, we have five, just like in case one. So all variants, all sort of variable options under the sun here. We had the AKRAS variant included as well as the expected EGFR variant. We had um, a second KRAS um, variant detected by two labs as well as the L858R variant in EGFR. We had a presence of a exon 19 deletion in EGFR and the um, T790M variant um, as 
the actual expected variant was not detected. And then we had the incorrect reporting of the presence of the uh, second EGFR mutation as well as the expected variant. So here you can see there's a huge range of different um, genotypes being reported. We saw predominantly false negative results being reported and there was 10 laboratories who did this and in response to really what Simon's point about the reporting the limitations and the actual scope of the test being performed, this really comes to it in its own here. So these 10 laboratories failed to report the presence of the EGFR variant. And because we did not know the scope or the limits of detection of the assay that they were used, whether or not 6% would be expected to be detected, um, and, or they had no um, details whatsoever of the assay performed, then we were not able to um, actually mark these EQAs um, results and we de determined that they were false negative results and therefore they were deemed as critical genotyping errors. Next slide please. So moving on to the interpretation, I guess the good news is there was only one critical interpretation error and as Simon stated that we don't um, apply any poor performance on the interpretation at this point in time. Um, this laboratory incorrectly stated that EGFR mutations are predicted a response to non-EGFR appropriate targeted therapy. So we, um, in the presence of EGFR variant associated with potential response to EGFR appropriate targeted therapy. And some labs we found that did not um, actually provide any specific interpretation of that result to the patient in that clinical case scenario provided. Um, there were a lot of generic statements either in a footer or hidden somewhere in the report that um, were not tailored to that specific case and really gave multiple different options of if this result is um, reported, this is what the outcome is, interpretive wise, and it was very unclear to find which interpretive comment was linked to actually that case. So again, another take home message, please provide specific interpretation of the result for the case that you are um, answering or the, the, the referral that you're, you're um, reporting on. And we were very strict and the assessors were keen to deduct marks just to make that um, emphasise that this is very, very important on a clinical report. So next slide, please. Simon, but over to you for our final case, the QA run. Thank you, Sandy. I've got my microphone turned on this time, so we're sorted. <laughs> um, so yes, the final case, case three. Uh, again, uh, a male sample, so from a patient born in 1965. In this case, the patient, again, been diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. Um, it, but contrast to the other type of cases, they'd already had testing of their primary tumour and they det detected a, a exon 19 deletion in EGFR. Uh, the patient had already received uh, first generation EGFR TKIs. Um, and after a period of time, the patient had relapsed um, and shown radiological progression of the primary tumor and further metastatic, metastatic lesions detected. Uh, so in this case, the patient was being asked for testing for, for plasma to see, uh, to identify any other further EGFR variants that might be uh, showing in the, in, the, in, the, in the CT DNA of the patient. So in this case, we weren't expecting to find any pathogenic variants in KRAS, uh, but we were. Uh, we had provided a sample this time with two uh, variants in EGFR, so a classic uh, sensitizing mutation in exon 19 EGFR and a resistance mutation um, uh, a T790M. Now the 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 selection of the variant allele frequencies again was carefully chosen here to reflect what we'd see in normal clinical practice. So it's very often the case that you see a much lower frequency, maybe 50% or lower of the, of the resistance mutation. So the sensitizing mutation was at 4% and the resistance mutation was at 2%. But again, the selection of these variant allele frequencies was chosen to make sure that the majority of laboratories could actually detect the T790M variant at 2%. Um, like case two, there were quite a high number of, uh, of critical genotyping errors and also a, a significantly higher number of interpretive errors as well in this case. So we had 12 critical genotyping errors representing 4.1% of the participant laboratories and five critical interpretation errors representing 1.7% of the participant laboratories doing this case. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, looking at critical genotyping error, in this case, it was failure to report the variant within the limits of detection or scope of the assay and or failure to report the variant uh, 
but not stating what the limits of detection or scope of the assay was, was. And this was a very common theme, as we've already pointed out, for the other two cases, and particularly prevalent on this sample. Next slide, please. So looking at in detail again now, in this case, there was quite a broad spread of equally between false positive and false, and false negative results. So there were five false positive results and, and six false negative results. For the, four, for the false positive results, the majority of them were um, incorrectly reporting the presence of the uh, L858 variant. Uh, they forget it wasn't supposed to be present in this sample, in addition to the expected Exxon 19 variant and the T790M resistance variant in EGFR. Uh, there was another laboratory that incorrectly reported the presence of a, um, two other, in fact, three other um, uh, EGFR variants, one of which is quite reasonably well known, so the CIS797R R variant in EGFR. Um, but of course, uh, the validation data and the, the manufacturing of the sample, we, we do obviously wouldn't expect to see any of these variants in that sample. Looking at the false negative samples, so for, sorry, false negative results, the majority of those results were laboratories reporting, uh, failing to report the deletion in, in, in Exxon 19, but uh, sorry, reporting the deletion in Exxon 19, but failing to report the T790 resistance mutation. Uh, and predominantly, the reasons for categorizing these as critical genotyping errors is, is that they, they stated that the limits of their assay was less than 2%. So in theory, they should have been able to detect the variant and therefore reported it as well. Uh, there was one other laboratory that didn't report the presence of either of the two EGFR variants. Uh, and in this case, they stated the limits of detection for both the variants is less than the variant allele frequencies provided. Uh, so they were also categorized as a critical genotyping error. Finally, there was one more uh, critical genotyping error relating to uh, misleading information provided in the report related to the genotype. So in the results section, the laboratory had stated that no, there was no mutation present in either of exons 18, 19, 20, or 21 of the EGFR gene. But the, clinic, the, clinic, the, the interpretive proportion of the report uh, actually stated that they detected uh, the, the T790M variant. So there was a discontinuity between the reported result and the statement in the actual res results itself, confirming they had found a variant in the sample. Okay, next slide, please. Looking at, in detail at the, um, the interpretive errors we detected, uh, again, a broad range. Uh, so there was one laboratory that stated that the T790M variant uh, related to a resistance was related to a resistance in first and second generation anti-EGFR uh, TKIs, with no mention of the of the uh, third generation uh, EGFR targeted therapies. Another laboratory, uh, which obviously would have been relevant to T790M, uh, another laboratory stated that the T790M variant is a, a, a frequent secondary somatic mutation that confers resistance, which is true. Um, Furthermore, clinical studies have reported limit, limited efficacy of uh, particular pa therapy in patients with non-small lung cancer who actually harbored that resistance variant. Uh, a third laboratory stated that T790M decreases the efficacy of EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And again, we know that um, that's not strictly correct. Uh, and another laboratory stated that EGFR mutations are predictive of response to non-EGFR appropriate targeted therapies. Finally, the last critical uh, interpretive error was that the laboratory stated that the plasma sample tested um, exhibited a sensitizing mutation and a resistance mutation, which increases or reduces, uh, I should think it should say, response to an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. And again, that's just sitting on the fence. You're not providing any, any strong indication of whether there's, there's going to be any likely benefit or not of, of that therapy response, of that therapy. So uh, this was a challenging case, uh, and certainly probably the most challenging case of the three cases. Um, and, um, but overall, the, the number of errors is still relatively small um, compared to the number of participants in the laboratory. So the take home message, I think, across all the EQAs is actually that the number of errors were, were, were reasonably low, less than 5% across all the different categories. Uh, next slide, please. So common deductions for this case. So a number of laboratories interpret the case wrongly in the context of the clinical context. So remember, Sandy was very clear about the real need to make sure that you read the referral. 
these cases are, are very carefully worded and, and the genotypes very carefully chosen to try and reflect real true clinical practice. Uh, and because the, the implementation of this type of testing is being used quite differently in many different contexts, it's really important to make sure you interpret the results in the case in the context of the clinical case scenario provided. Um, so that was the, a, a very common theme we saw across this, uh, across this and the other cases. And the other uh, common deduction, or if you like, common deduction was the presence of um, the presentation of separate interpretations. So laboratories interpreting the results of the different variants they found separately and not putting them together in a, in a cohesive way that really gave the, 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 the overall result for that patient. So uh, it, was very, it means the reports are very really difficult to read and the clinician doesn't find it easy or won't find it easy to actually pull out the salient points from the report. Okay, next slide, please. So other interpretive issues, just to highlight a few, there's a few of them here. Again, common themes across this, but this case, but also across some of the other. So uh, common theme is not re recommending further testing because of course, clearly, the, the present that if you don't find the variant doesn't necessarily mean the variant's not present. It could do to do with the amount of circulating tumor DNA in the CFDNA sample provided, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important to make sure there's a recommendation for further testing. Um, no variant results, but the presence, no variants detected or results, but the presence of the original variant, no variant and results and no original variant detected. Overinterpretation of the var of, of what happens when you don't find a variant. Um, the use, and this is a common theme we see um, in many of our EQAs, the use of the terms positive and negative, which can be very easily misinterpreted uh, by a clinician as to meaning something completely different to what you're trying to say. Um, again, limited, limited scope of the test applied. So, so um, we've, we've already seen plenty of evidence in all those three cases about the uh, laboratories that aren't stating what they've really tested or how they've tested it. Uh, and no interpretation of the result with respect to EGFR appropriate targeted therapy. So again, certainly in the context of uh, resistance mutations, laboratories should really be thinking about the third generation TKIs. Um, so if you're interested in, in, in reading, reading more about the details, then please do obviously make sure you read this, the summary scheme report, which has a really thorough and, and completely comprehensive um, uh, report on, on the outcome of the EQA and the way the laboratories performed and goes into all these themes in much more detail. Okay, next slide, please. So finally, uh, some acknowledgements, and uh, it would be remiss of Sandy and myself not to mention, firstly, the two people in, from our organizations that have done all the work. Sandy and I have done none of the work here. These are the people who have really done all the hard work. So Jenny and Mel uh, from a GenQA and EMQN, and also to all the assessors uh, who helped us do the assessment, as Sandy alluded to earlier, the experts. These are the people who really know the stuff. Um, and without them, um, we, we couldn't provide these EQAs to the same level, high level and quality that we, we expect of ourselves as well as the laboratories. And finally, obviously, to you, the laboratories that participated and took part in the EQA. So uh, I think that's that's it from myself and Sandy, and we're going to move on to Dr. Rolfo, I think, Alex. Yes, uh, thank you, Sandy and Simon, for the presentation. And uh, just to remind everybody that we will have enough time at the end of the webinar. So put your questions into the Q&A uh, window. We will address all of them after the webinar. And now uh, to you, Professor Rolfo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And actually, for an oncologist, speaking with pathologists is really a dream. So uh, I thanks to Professor Deans and, and Dr. Patton for the great uh, insight of this. I think it's very interesting to have this data of the uh, this uh, survey because it's given the reality what is happening around the world in the testing. So that's are my disclosures. And I will try to summarize a little bit some concepts in liquid biopsy as an oncologist that I think are very important for pathologists to, to take in consideration. So we know that in the last years, uh, uh, lung cancer was changing completely in the landscape of therapeutics because we was passing from uh, analyzing drugs or putting drugs in patients to see which one of them to respond to determine molecular profiling on patients and get another biomarker, so predictive biomarkers, and even uh, changing our vision of how we are not only treated, but also how we are uh, designing clinical trials for these patients in the future. 
Uh, obviously, we are talking today about liquid biopsy, but we don't need to forget that it was the parting. And actually, uh, uh, as a pathologist, you are departing from the tissue. And we know that there are advantage and disadvantage. One of the disadvantage that the tissue have is the lack of capture of the tumor heterogeneity. And I think this is uh, uh, important right now because if we are talking about uh, driver alterations, we need to know what happened also at level of the clonal evolution of the disease. Obviously, it's, it's really important to have the advantage of pathologies, uh, of pathology as a information assessment, also of some other biomarkers that we are using now, for example, of immunotherapy. But one of the advantage of liquid biopsy, when we are using platforms, so when we are trying to get a, a big information is that we are capturing this um, heterogeneity. There are also the possibility to be repeat over the time. And this is fantastic for our patients in terms of monitoring. And uh, some of the disadvantage, uh, obviously, and that could be part of the uh, false positive or false negative that could come from, for example, from clonal hematopoiesis. That is a big uh, still problems in some of the platforms and uh, that we have because we don't have actually a 100% a filter that is uh, avoiding completely this, uh, this problem, uh, with exception if we are going to other methodologies that we will see later on. So I was talking about heterogeneity, and I think it's really important that we internalize the concept that there is not only the heterogeneity in the sample that we are analyzing, but also in the intrapatient heterogeneity. And this is a very important concept when we are treating patients with TKI, because uh, we are not only looking for one driver mutation, we are checking for the commutations that can impact in the outcome of these patients. And also in case, for example, nowadays, <clears throat> we are going a little bit further and analyzing the liquid biopsy of the CSF, for example, in patients who are progressing in the brain exclusively. The liquid biopsy could be a uh, or the CTD analysis, analysis could be applicable in all the journey of the patient. We started with a lot of uh, data and robust data in uh, metastatic disease. And there, uh, unfortunately, even if we have a plethora of, uh, of drugs that were approved recently by FDA, the testing rate, and this is an analysis that was presented in ASCO last year from my lung consortium, that is an, a consortium of uh, practice uh, in the United States, and you see that 50% of the patients are tested. Uh, and we are talking here about the most common um, targets. So we are not talking even about a track or red fusions. And uh, we have also the, uh, the, the data coming from disparities. If we are applying that to, for example, uh, African-American population, we are going to 39%. So very, we are doing as an oncologist very badly in, uh, in asking that, but also in the creation of flowcharts or, or the flows um, is in the institutions to get obviously uh, reflect testing in some of the uh, patients that, that that will be obviously helping uh, for the detection. This is the rate of the increase of the detection over the years and is not comparable at all with the approval that we had for the new compounds driver uh, for driver alterations. One of the studies that I would like to refer is the Nile study that was an, uh, uh, like this one was also a, a war, real world data. And in this analysis, they, they include patients who have tissue and liquid biopsy to see what happened in this core co uh, concordance, but also how many patients are able to really have an, uh, a complete uh, analysis of the eight guidelines recommended biomarker at the time of uh, uh, by NCCM guidelines. And you see here that several of the patients have the, the black spot is the quantity non-sufficient. Uh, and if you see the concordance was really high, 98.2%, uh, 98.2% 98 predictive positive value with the CTDNA and uh, hi high sensitivity for the eight gui guidance recommended biomarkers, that was 80%. One of the things that is really important is the reduction of the CTDNA results. So, uh, and that is what we are doing actually is a blood first because we received the results several times before the tissue biopsy. And uh, when we are using this complementary approach, 
the increase of the the increase of the detection is around 48 percent so the blood first approach that when we receive the results is obviously something that we are applying uh, and actually there are other trials like this uh, this is the bfast trial that is a prospective analysis checking for the uh, blood as a uh, only source of uh, uh, testing for these patients there are several cohorts actually it's very dynamic this uh, design some of the cohort like the red was closed because the the drug was not the, the correct one to to have for this uh, driver. But in the, in the case of ALK, for example, the data that we have are very similar with the uh, pivotal trial that was using the same drug for, uh, for a tissue analysis. So it's very important that we can test our patients and have this uh, opportunity to treat them. In 2018, we published by ILCLC the first statement paper. Uh, about liquid biopsy, and we uh, gave to liquid biopsy and a secondary role after the tissue biopsy was insufficient. And then when we are talking about uh, patients with advanced disease progressing to TKI, we gave to liquid biopsy the first opportunity for detect the, uh, minim the um, uh, mechanism of resistance that was involved in this progression. Nowadays, we have a new statement paper that was published in October last year. And uh, we, beside the sequential approach that we gave in 2018, we are talking now about complementary approach, similar to what I was talking in the Nile study, but also the blood or the plasma first approach that is really what I say is happening when we are using the complementary approach. But also we include the monitoring that here is very important. Several of the vendors in the United States are including right now on a kind of combo that allow to the doctors to do for the same approval, uh, one test in the beginning and six to 10 weeks after the treatment with TKI is starting to see the dynamics of the DNA as a, a predictive biomarker for uh, outcomes. Uh, we were talking and I saw one of the questions uh, uh, here in the chat that uh, how we, we get the, the allelic fraction, obviously that I will let uh, Dr. Deans and, and Patton to answer that, but what is important that we are using this uh, quantity of DNA present in the sample uh, that is obviously re related to the uh, burden of the disease as a predicted biomarker. And uh, this is, for example, an iconographic representation of the buff you see here in the top of the list. This is the buff for, from the very beginning. Uh, in a journey of a patient that was the patient that was treated, this patient have an EGFR mutation, common mutation, with some companion mutations like TP53 and EGFR amplification that are, are obviously not a good companions that I call the troublemakers. Uh, this patient was responding very well to the uh, first, um, first treatment that was a third generation TKI. And you see the, the reduction of the buff, uh, really a very nice reduction, complete response in the, almost complete response in the, in the lung, complete response in the brain. But after a very short time of two years due to this companion, and this is important why we are looking next generation sequencing panels, uh, because we have this information, this patient was having an, a progression with a small lesion that was a 797S uh, EGFR mutation that is a common mechanism of resistance for third generation TKI. This patient received radiation, but uh, in a very short time, you see here from July to August, you have a big progression. And, uh, and we did at that time due to the uh, position of the mutation and uh, a TKI of first, first generation with a very good response. These areas that you see here are related to uh, radiation and pneumonitis. But obviously after five months, we was pushing other mechanisms of resistance typical for first generation TKI. And that was the T790M that uh, arise. This patient had multiple nodules. We gave chemotherapy as you see here and reduction again of the uh, allelic fraction variation. So this is a very nice example how we are customizing the treatment patients according to the monitoring of these mutations and the clonal evolution. Uh, we were talking about BAF, and this is a, a waterfall plot showing a very nice response in almost the majority of the patients, including complete response. And what is important from this study that the majority of the patients have an above that was very, very low, because this is a a common co um, confusion that the, or, or mistake that the oncologists are doing 
thinking that they need to have a percentage of buff that is high for response to the patients to the TKI. And that is not really true. As far the patient have a buff that is presenting the mutation or confirming the mutation, they can respond very nicely. These dynamics of the buff we are using not only in the TKI, as I said before, but also we are now moving to the space of immunotherapy and patients who have ctDNA positive or increase uh, are going uh, worse than the patients who have a decrease and in, in both, of, both the scenarios for overall survival and progression-free survival. And that is used also for other mutations that, or aberrations like you see here in uh, our translocation. Uh, obviously, all this tsunami of genomic information is, is really to to, to decipher it and have an, a good interpretation. So we are working now with uh, two more boards and obviously in the two more boards, we need to have some rules and we are applying some level of evidence like these ones that, that is Onco KB and I invite you to go for the website. This is an, a level of evidence created by Memorial Sloan Kettering and you have a level of evidence one, for example, is uh, the, the typical case of EGFR with a FDA recognized biomarker and drug but we are going to other biomarkers on, on other levels, for example, a level uh, 3A, and this is the case that there are compelling clinical evidence, but neither the biomarker or the drugs are approved for that indication. And that is the case, for example, of ATM mutations and uh, uh, PARP inhibitors, that, for example. Another level of evidence that we are using, uh, uh, in Europe, there is the SCAP, this is the European this, uh, Society of Medical Oncology, ESMO, create this, uh, this it's a little bit more dynamics, I need to say, that is a little bit more complicated for a clinical oncologist to be applied. Other level of, of evidence that are really uh, simple, sim is a simplification of the, of the level. This is the MD Anderson, that is only three levels, but it's also uh, very easy to apply in the clinical practice. We did an analysis using the OncoKB in uh, patients who go for, uh, first, for phase one trials, actually, and we saw when we are applying the tissue and the liquid biopsy, even if we have levels 3A, patients are able to enter easily in the clinical trials and have at least a rationale for these uh, phase one trials for patients when we have these discussions. Another scenario that we are now uh, talking and is, is really interesting and we will see a lot of things going on in the, in the near future is the minimal residual disease. And here approach we will see, and I will not enter here in the details, but we will have several approaches that are tumor informed and tumor uninformed approach. So be prepared for this uh, near future. We have several clinical trials going on. And, and the idea is to obviously to monitor in these patients. And, and here with EGFR, we will have a very important, uh, important activity because with the third generation TKI, actually a in new indication for patients who have an, a resection and even an adjuvant opportunity, this will be important to uh, tailor and monitor in these patients over the time to see when they are relapsing. Uh, the same concept in adjuvant is arriving to immunotherapy. And we have here, for example, this is the one of the uh, trials that we are using an immunocheckpoint inhibitor uh, in adjuvant setting. And we see that patients who have ctDNA positive are going worse than patients with ctDNA negative after the adjuvant treatment uh, in terms of disease-free survival. And so we, we will have a lot of things going on in the future. And early detection is the, the new holy grail in liquid biopsy. And there are obviously the idea to increase the detection of the screening programs with low dose CT scan. And we are also using tumor informant, a tumor and informant. I was talking in the very beginning about the, um, the clonal hematopoiesis is a problem here. But when we are using, for example, methylation of the DNA or leukocyte analysis as well, we are avoiding one of these problems. And we saw that there are some data very interesting in terms of specificity, uh, very weak still uh, in terms of uh, uh, sensitivity, but very promising, I would say, for uh, the future in detection of drugs, of uh, lung cancer in the very beginning. So this is a slide that shows that I'm a dated oncologist, but in the future, if we have the opportunity to ask to somebody who is coming back from there, uh, the future of liquid biopsy seems to be very cool with all these other analytes uh, 
uh, in, in place and, and we can be able to use them and we cannot wait for be there. But I hope that the, the person who is coming from the future is not telling us that there's still people not testing and, and that will be very frustrating. So with that, I, I close and I invite you for the uh, International Society of Liquid Biopsy annual meeting that will be in Florida this year in Miami in 21 and 22 of October. And I'm happy to answer the question with Dr. Dean Sampato. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rolfo. So we have some questions uh, in the chat. So I, I welcome uh, Professor Deans and uh, Dr. Patton to uh, answer the ones which are related to you. Thank Great. you, Alex. Okay, Alex. Um, Simon, do you want to kick us off then? Yep. Um, so we've got um, a question about, uh, we see there are different false negative and false positive results, some of which uh, could directly affect clinical management. Could we know what methods that generate the most errors? Uh, and I think we've also got another a question, which is very similar to this. Are there discrepant results, re wrong results, interpretations related to a single gene test or to next generation, generation tests? Um, I've just checked the EQA scheme report, and this year we haven't provided a breakdown of the methodologies that call and how they how the errors are distributed across the different methodologies. Um, it, it's something we quite often and frequently do if we find it, particularly if we find any clear trends, and, and EQA is very good at detecting these types of errors. Um, we haven't done that, and I haven't got the data in front of me, uh, but it's something we can probably we could probably break out if we need to, and we'll certainly be looking at doing that in the future. But yes, we can do that. Uh, we just haven't done it in this, e this year's EQA. Simon, I think the reason for that is there was no actual trends. Um, we often, through the EQAs, as you say, we can detect maybe some nuances or, or issues with particular kits, and we normally feed that back to the commercial companies themselves yeah. and the participants using them. This year, I think, as we see, basically when when um, clinical testing is getting embedded, just like liquid biopsy testing is now. There's no real um, themes and issues. It's really just business as usual errors. Um, I think you can get different, particularly for interpretation, that tends to be something completely different and tends to be more educational, regardless of what type of methodologies that is employed within the laboratory. Um, but also we see different types of errors um, for single gene tests and for NGS mm -hmm. panels. So they all have errors, um, but they maybe are generated from different issues within the laboratory. Um, we also see quite a lot of sample swaps um, happening within the laboratory as well from any point in within sample research DNA extraction, testing, and even just submitting results or putting the results from the, the platforms into the reports. So I think um, we don't want to get sued, obviously, by naming and shaming any particular kits or, or methodologies, but I think the take home message there is just know your limitations of the methods that you're employing um, very, very well so you can report them accurately. Yeah, I would agree entirely with all of that, Sandy. And the other thing I would add, obviously, is that from the slides, you can see that there were 60 different types of tests used. Absolutely. And so any error we would see would be diluted down by the fact there's a sheer huge number of different tests there. So it would be very hard, as you say, to establish uh, some really clear trends. But you, you're quite right. In any circumstance where we see a really clear trend, we will nearly always go back to the manufacturer, for example, and to have a discussion with them about methodologies, etc. And actually, uh, if I can say something, uh, that was a, a problem for us when we was doing the guidelines, because trying to be international and give an uh, international view of all, obviously we prefer next generation sequencing and we say that, but we need to be aware also that the realities in different countries is completely different. Um, but uh, if, if we can uh, give some recommendations also for, the, for example, the T17IM, that is uh, still a problem in several countries that we don't have third generation TKI, approve uh, some of the methods that they are using, like the uh, COVAS version two is really weak in the detection of this mutation. We are talking about 59%. So it's uh, having a uh, um, plethora, as uh, uh, Simon say, of different uh, testing is giving uh, a variability in the results. But obviously if we are focused or, or we are doing a sub analysis of your results for the really high sensitive platform like next generation sequencing or digital Doppler PCR, the result will be obviously more higher, no? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. 
So Simon, um, we've got another couple that are sort of linked as well, and that's about allelic frequency. Mm. So how do we get the variant allelic frequency? Which variant allelic frequency is most commonly used for estimation of the variant content in a large background of non-tumor DNA in selfie DNA analysis? Why is this module requesting the variant copies per mil, assuming per mil of plasma? Um, and also what is the limit of detection suggested for real life liquid biopsy testing? Um, so all sort of themes there. Um, variant allelic frequency can be picked up through your bioinformatics, um, if you're particularly using NGS. So I would suggest you speak to your bioinformatics team to find out how you um, you get that information. Um, it's also very important to interpret the result, um, whether or not particularly if you've not picked up um, a variant there about what your limit of detection is, and that should be determined before you start any clinical testing. Um, I think for the what happens in real life, you have to go back to what the clinical question is that's being asked. Um, um, Dr. Roffel mentioned about when you're doing um, monitoring residual disease, obviously that is a slightly different question if you're doing upfront diagnosis because you can't get a tissue sample, for example. Um, for monitoring, you want to go down to, I would say, about the 0.1% mark. Um, but I think obviously if you're doing a diagnosis, you not, don't necessarily need to go down as low as that. It depends on what your clinical team will act upon. Um, we know that some um, ctDNA testing is happening, but clinicians won't act upon it until there's actually some sort of radiological evidence there or there's a relapse sort of starting to show clinically. Um, so again, I think it's about that speaking to your clinical team, understanding why you're doing the testing and how it should be reported and your assay should reflect, should reflect that. Um, and then finally, I'll, Simon, I'll come to you to add on to that about the we're expressing variant copies per mil of plasma. And this, we know that many um, ways of determining the amount of um, mutant or pathogenic variant within samples is available and labs use different ways to determine that. Um, we have used um, copies per mil because we are using artificial commercially made plasma specifically for us and that is the way that the manufacturers are determining in that variant level um, so really it's a nuance of the the eqa scheme that that is the mechanism that we have used to um, determine how what we want from the the commercial company um, and then we portray that across to the labs and also supply how much dna is actually in that plasma sample um, simon do you want to add any of that i know it's all sort of packed together around Variant yeah. allele frequencies. Yeah, I would add to particularly to the last point that I think this is, I mean, this is an interesting question and it's actually mm. very assay specific as well. Um, and the the way you establish the 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 either the you know the, the number of copies of a variant or the variant allele frequency itself is very dependent on the test technology you use, but also the validation of your test and should be, you know, in many cases it's probably appropriate to actually do try to establish both as part of your limitations of your test, nasty specificity. So it's 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 not easy to do, we accept that. Uh, and as Sandy said, the reason we, re we report in the EQA in this particular context is be primarily because that's how our specification and manufacture from our manufacturer came. Um, so we're using the, the, you know, the validated assay that they use that's done to an ISO specification as well as the, as you like, the starting point, the truth of the, of the number of copies present in that sample. And as it's artificially manufactured, it's reasonably easy for them to determine what that is. Um, the other thing I'd like to add is, is, is to what is the limited detection suggested for real life tissue bi uh, biopsy test, liquid biopsy testing. And again, I, th I think this is, I mean, this is an, a very interesting question and very, and, and I think hotly debated perspective as well. Uh, and Dr. Rolf, I'm sure will have much more to add to it than I will, but Really, I don't think at the moment, you know, the, the, the test, this, this approach to this type of testing using liquid biopsy is still, I would argue, in its infancy. Um, and how it's implemented in clinical practices is still not, you know, still not very cohesively done. And there's, there, are, there is, a, I think, in my opinion, more guidance that could be given to, to, to laboratories and, and the clinicians as well about the when it's appropriate to use it and what levels of sensitivity etc that you should be using um so i think as the as the technology evolves and the and the pathways the clinical pathways evolve we'll have much more feel for you know what this limited detection really should be but as sandy said if you were doing minimal residual disease it should be pretty low but clinical diagnostics maybe doesn't need to be quite as low as that 
Um, okay. Um, maybe I can I can say something about that. So uh, obviously, for the metastatic disease, uh, is really clear with the. We are talking about vendors because there is here a big difference. What happened with vendors with next generation sequencing, and what we are doing in uh, in house. And here in house, we have several other problems that we need to face that are really standardized in vendors that are, for example, the pre-analytical condition. So that could be an, a, given an important variability of the results that we have. So in terms of the vendors, what we have approved by FDA here, uh, that is, is really no. We have an, a, barrier, a, a limit of detection that is, is above that we can calculate. And it's really clear that we can uh, take uh, even alterations that are 0.01 or 0.1% of the buff. This is a really uh, nice sensitivity. If we are moving to, like you say, Simon, in minimal residual disease, there we have a still application of other kind of, of platform. So um, we need to be very careful when we are discussing about in-house and vendors because sensitivity and conditions and everything are completely different. So it needs to be, and actually uh, that was one of the problems of the, uh, in the, in the um, survey of the American College of Pathology in general in test for tissue and liquid, how we are reporting, how we are doing the pre-analytical condition quality of controls for uh, the in-house technology. So this is a really interesting uh, point of consideration. We have two EQA specific questions remaining at the moment. And then I think Dr. Rolfo, there's quite a few for you. So if we just do those two first and then we hand sure. over. So um, we have why as a deduction evaluated a recommendation for new testing of a new sample, it is known that the level of CFDNA changes. I think that's um, a misinterpretation of, of the presentation. So we said the deduction was um, applied when there was no recommendation for new testing or a new sample taken. So it, again, it comes down to over interpretation when no var variant has been detected. Um, you don't have that reassurance there that you've actually tested any tumour DNA so the, the, um, really the idea would be you would ask for a repeat blood sample to um, repeat that testing or look to see whether you can get a biopsy or if there's another tissue sample available. Simon, do you think that's that's the misinterpretation there of that question? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and then Simon, one final one to come to you that was about the EQA. Um, it says... Didn't hear at the beginning of the meeting, but we mentioned that there was an unsuitable kit used by a lab in Egypt. I don't think that's the case. We've not touched upon anything linked no. to any countries. No, no, no answers book kits, as we discussed recently, <laughs> not very long ago. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Don't want to um, <laughs> misinterpret anything. Um, Alex, will we come back to you if you want to look at some yeah, of actually, the other questions? I, I have one question to you, uh, Dr. Deans and Dr. Patton. From your <laughs> experience, uh, have you noticed any trend in failure rates when you're comparing uh, large uh, CGP panels versus more targeted panels with a smaller number of uh, uh, targets in it? Not, not, in it. not yeah. particularly, no, Simon, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. No, I mean, I think we, we, we kind of touched upon it earlier on, is that there's such a large number of different tests, Alex, and that we didn't detect any common themes. Okay. But I think maybe it's because we're not asking for multiple targets to be reported. So we wouldn't know if you couldn't generate data for other targets as well as EGFR and KRAS. So that leads on quite nicely to some of the other questions that have been submitted. And, and that's about fusions and detecting other clinically relevant variants, particularly in lung cancer. And both EMQN and GenQA are, are currently designing, in collaboration with IQN PATH, um, a multiple biomarker um, EQA um, in liquid biopsies. So that's looking mm -hmm. at your panels with larger and including the fusions in there. Um, we also know that the N-track fusions are something that's becoming very more pertinent for testing across the different cancer types um, and other markers, for example, in breast cancer setting. So that's sort of the next generation of our EQAs that will be coming out. So um, we will be putting a call out to our, our laboratories to see if you want to, to participate in those EQAs coming forward. So again, it's if we don't ask for multiple targets to be reported we don't know if maybe they're failing as well in particular the fusion so 
we've always got a challenge ahead of us, I think. <laughs> Although I, undoubtedly, I also expect that it'll be much more challenging. I mean, it's a much more difficult ask, isn't it, as Absolutely. well? So it's going to be very, very challenging as a field of testing, I think. Yeah, in some, in some of the fusions, like you mentioned, uh, in track, that is a really important challenge for liquid biopsy. We published uh, the first data of only one gene, that was the NTA, NTRK1, because uh, put in, the, in a platform, uh, actually for a vendor, but we are not talking in-house, in uh, with all the uh, possibilities of fusion partner, because NTRAC is very promiscuous in terms of partners for uh, fusion. So it's really difficult. You need to have a platform with a very high sensitivity and now we are arriving there, uh, but uh, for that will be a challenge for in-house uh, technology, I think. Mm. Because you need to have quality controls for every fusion. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's uh, this yep. is a I see here that there's a question, can we determine TMB by ctDNA? And uh, yes, we can, but be careful <laughs> because obviously <laughs> the length of the platform that you have is not the yeah. same to calculate with 76 genes or uh, with a whole genome sequencing. So that's, uh, that's the tricky part. And I, I'm not really like it to see uh, at the moment the only one number in TMB. I think we need to be a little bit more um, smart to find uh, which kind of mutations are really involved in the presentation of neoantigens, for example. But it seems that the BAF or the MAF are much more sensitive than TMB in the last results that we saw in clinical trials. Alex. Dr. Oh, sorry, Sandy. <laughs> I was going to say there's one, and I'm quite intrigued to, to hear your answer to this. This is more pathology-based. So somebody has asked, can we predict with any confidence the histology of a cancer like non-small cell <laughs> lung cancer using liquid biopsy? I was trying to avoid that. In a, in a <laughs> I thought pathology. you might be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can say, obviously, pathology is in that we cannot really replace. But what we have, for example, example in EGFR and we saw in some patients with EGFR uh, as a mechanism of resistance could be the transformation to, e to a small cell lung cancer and, and that obviously with the liquid biopsy cannot be predicted but can be I would say uh, seen as a tendency for example if we have some companion mutations and that is the case of retinoblastoma 1, RB1 and TP53. If we have a patient that from the very beginning have these mutations as a companion of EGFR this patient have a possibility to develop that. And if we are losing these mutations over the time, that could be an indication. The contrary way, ganancy of this mutation was also related with the histology of a small cell lung cancer. But this is just uh, one interpretation. We need to have the pathologist. What happened is that in some patients, we don't have histology. And that is happening also in other scenario that is in early stage, when we have patients that we don't have histology and we need to treat this patient with re, um, SRS, for example, with radiotherapy, and we don't have histology. And that is the common question that we have in the tumor boards. Can we have an idea what is happening with this patient? Is it a cancer or not? We don't have this data, unfortunately. I ask you just, we, we're seeing a lot of um, referrals for liquid biopsy coming in, particularly following COVID and with our huge, particularly in the UK, a huge backlog of cancer referrals. Um, are you saying that, you know, are you getting a lot of referrals coming in without that histology because you haven't got a, tish, a tissue to assess, first of all? Do you yeah. have that triage process in place? Yeah, that, so we see, unfortunately, you know, all patients that have a very big epoch or COPD, or they have a, a, a very small uh, lung nodule that are really difficult to arrive with, even with a bronchoscopy or in a transthoracic puncture. So it's really difficult to get there. And sometimes we say, okay, we will treat this patient because have all this nodule was following and is growing and have the character, radiological characteristic. We are using now radiomics as well to identify some of features. But even though we don't have the histology, so uh, I think this will be a, a really nice scenario where liquid biopsy can can give an important contribution. Yeah, and we've just started a trial in the in the UK in the, in NHS England about looking at um, use use of liquid biopsies where there's not a confirmed diagnosis yet. So that will be very um, um, interesting to see the results from that. And actually the methylation, for example, there is a company now that was approved by uh, the Medicare, that is the company for reimbursement, not still approved by FDA, 
but is uh, using methylation and we saw in lung cancer, the sensitivity is uh, for stage one is 21% with a high, high specificity, but the sensitivity is low. So still we are missing several patients. That will be a problem. So I think we, in the future, we will see a lot of multi-omics approach to identify this situation. So I hope so. <laughs> we have, um... We have one uh, one last question, I think, by the looks of it. So this question is, and I think we'll, 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 we, Sandy and I should be able to take it, but uh, uh, Dr. Rolfo, if we can't, um, we're coming to you. Uh, <laughs> what is the recommended method for the pre QC before DNA analysis? And I think my response to this would be that it's, it, our, our response from as an EQA provider is that we can't obviously make a recommendations of the particular method you use. And we certainly know from the, this EQA that there are many different methods being used in the pre-analytical process of the, the, of the extraction of the DNA, if you like. Um, but one thing is for sure is that um, you need to be using an assay that has been validated for CFDNA. Um, and there is good evidence from several other EQAs we provide of lab, labs where they're not using an assay, a pre-analytical step that's been validated for CFDNA where there is a higher chance of making or getting errors because you're not extracting the right amount of DNA or it's the right wrong fragment size, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's true that you need to be making sure you use the right type of assay for the pre-analytical step. Would you not agree, Sandy? Absolutely. I think that's the take home message, isn't it? That you tailor what your assay is for what your the end answer that you're trying to yeah. um, obtain. Um, as you say, the, the, we perform a, an EQA for DNA extraction from blood and tissue, tissue types, not for liquid biopsy yet. Um, and we, again, we see huge variability um, between labs um, trying to determine concentration and quality of the DNA, even using the same methodologies. So there's huge variability out there. And I think it's about making sure that you validate what you do in your lab gives you the right result. It's, um, you know, it's arbitrary in a way between labs it's as long as your processes um, are fit for purpose yeah, yeah there are also some uh, in this regard there are some uh, societies or or groups that are working in, in preclinical analy analytical condition and uh, this is the case of blood pack that is an uh, was coming like an a uh, moonshot uh, initiative for the government in the period of the government of uh, uh, Biden, and then became a group, uh, sorry, Biden, uh, Barack Obama, and became a, a, a group of uh, stakeholders putting together some guidelines. And they published some of the guidelines for pre-analytical conditions that I think are very valuable. And also we are working on, as the Society of Liquid Biopsy with the American uh, Molecular Pathology to trying to get some uh, I will not say consensus because we don't have a still rules, but at least some uh, picture what has happened for the uh, minimal requirement for liquid biopsies labs to work. Because obviously we have an, a hole in the, uh, I would say not legislation, but rules uh, implementations. So for this reason, we see several uh, variabilities in different areas of the world. And actually some of the regions in the world, I saw that they are selling, for example, uh, exosome results. So that is, uh, is really completely not acceptable when we have a not validation process. So I think we need to do a lot to make um, rules and, and try to make an harmonization between the technologies that we have. Alex. Agreed, agreed entirely on that one. <clears throat> um. Dr. Rolfo, can I ask you this, this question here? So somebody said they've read that some tumours are better ctDNA shedders than others, and I think we were aware of that, um, and also aware of, of you know, exercise and all other different things that can potentially affect levels of ctDNA. Um, does this affect the clinical utility? Yeah, so that's a problem in some patients. Uh, we call the non sheeters that are patients that are really not having any alteration. And even we saw that in some patients that have a really big tumoral burden. So it's not depending on tumoral burden in some patients. Um, uh, we don't know what is that. In the beginning, we was putting all the blame in the technologies. Obviously, we was using Sanger sequencing. It's completely different from the uh, high throughput next generation sequencing. And But there is a still patients that are completely non sheeter and we see this differences between tissue positive and liquid biopsy negative. And that's a problem for monitoring these patients. Uh, so that's, that's something that we need to, to reflect. We and have also, one question about, uh, sorry, Dr. Rolfo, go on. 
No, I say I was mentioning another thing that is interesting, and we are trying to implement in collaboration with the with the technology that Memorial is doing the, in the impact uh, for CSF results, and that is when we have and that uh, happen in some patients who have only brain metastasis as a as a progression site, and we don't see nothing in the liquid biopsy. So the use of CSF seems to be open a door for customized patients treatment, uh, specifically also because CSF, and, and you can confirm uh, that is much more pure than the liquid, than the blood yeah. to analyze this mutation. So that is a, a future that we will see. Obviously it's an invasive situation because we need an uh, LP for the patients to have the results, but it's giving an interesting, uh, interesting point of view for, for treat the patients. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. We have one question about pre-analytical QC. Uh, what would be recommendations from both EQA perspective and from liquid biopsy perspective? Because obviously for liquid biopsy, it's uh, very, very important. Are there any uh, recommendations or standard ways to do it before it will go into uh, analytical phase? Um, I think, um, Alex, we we can't make recommendations for particular um, assays or way of doing things. Again, it goes back to the in-house validation in the laboratory that you know that your extraction and, and what you have, have generated um, CFDNA-wise is going to be fit for purpose to get your result from the method that you're actually using. Um, we know that when, sa when samples are, are moved between labs, um, they might work brilliantly in one laboratory where it's been validated, but not necessarily in the other laboratory when things are slightly different. So I think, you know, and as Simon says, the over 60 different methodologies, and that's not even looking at the extraction techniques on top of that. Um, who knows how many variables are out there? Um, so I would say really is the general message is to to make your in-house end-to-end pipeline work yeah pretty much use whatever you validated yeah exactly mm -hmm. yes yeah if we can wrap up with the one take-home message we will say uh, if you don't oh, my recommendation as an oncologist i will say if you don't have uh, in your uh, institution uh, all the implementation or all the, the, the capacity to do next generation sequencing or testing or whatever you are using in the technologies, uh, don't experiment with that. Try to create instead some uh, networking with big institutions that they have this and the expertise, because it's not the same to do one every three months that have 100 every month. So it's important that we have at this connection between the, the big centers and work together because we are treating patients here. So that's the, the most important thing that we need to remember. And I think that's where we see the critical interpretations coming through potentially as well. You need to keep up to date with the most recent um, information that's available in the trials. And really that comes with doing it all the time um, and not dipping in mm. and out. So I would say that, yeah, again, I would echo that. And I would add, add just onto that is that the EQAs is also, that's one of the things we're looking at. You know, we're trying to set clinical scenarios that challenge the, the knowledge of the laboratories and the scientists doing the, the, doing the, doing the testing and the, the writing the reports. And you can see from this year that, you know, we've included the, the KRAS G12C for that exactly that reason. We, we need to see laboratories starting to consider all the options, not just figure fixed on one particular type of variant or type of test. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have one very uh, technical question, I guess, to uh, Dr. Rolfo. If I centrifuge the whole blood sample collected on EDTA tube and store the plasma at minus 80 degrees, how long uh, CFDNA can be stable and usable for analysis? I think I'm not the right person to answer that, but we are using, <laughs> we are trying to use extract tubes because they're much more easy to handle. Uh, so there are several things because sometimes as an oncologist, I say to my nurse, take the blood and I know that uh, if the blood is taken and uh, I, I have the trust that the blood is going to the lab immediately, but we don't know what is happening between the blood is taken and the blood is arriving. So I don't know the temperature condition. I don't know how, how delay is arriving. So the best is try to use tubes that are 
uh, uh, like the structures that you can have even for 96 hours or so 72, 96 hours. With the ADT tubes, uh, we prefer to have an uh, immediately um, um, process, at least a couple of hours maximum, but that is in our institution. So we are what we are doing that. But I don't know if Sandy or Simon, if you have more experience in the part of the techniques, what is your experience on the EDT tubes? Uh, you're absolutely spot on. That's generally what's happening here. I think what comes though with using strec tubes in particular is the education that you don't put them in the fridge. You don't do what you normally do with a blood tube. So that adds another level of, of difficulty with implementation, but uh, you know, that's not a blocker and it, it does make a huge impact on the, the CTDNA that's um, extracted at the other end. So it, it's worth persevering, I would say. That's our experience in the UK anyway. Great, thank you very much for your uh, participation, for your time, for great presentations, and uh, thanks a lot for our participants for great questions and for the very, very useful uh, discussion. And uh, I guess with this, we will uh, wrap up. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward for uh, future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.